Live from Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering Google Cloud Next 17. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're live here in Palo Alto for two days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the cloud wars, the cloud game, conquering the cloud. Obviously this week in San Francisco, Google Next 2017 is going on. We have our reporters and our analysts in San Francisco. We're calling them live in a short time. But we're here in studio in our new 4,500 square foot uh, studio in Palo Alto, getting reaction to all the commentary in the news, the keynotes, Diane Green's March to Conquer the Cloud in a Google-esque way. Our next guest is Joe Arnold, the founder and chief product officer of Swift Stack and uh, CUBE alumni, a member of the community, as we've seen you a lot, a lot of all the different events, but you, you've been in the middle of all this stuff. Joe, welcome to the CUBE coverage. Thanks for having me, John. So, I'm glad you could come on because one of the things that's really going on in the cloud world right now, I, I sometimes call it the Cold War of the cloud. You know, there's like, uh, there's, a, there's a shifting going on, there's, there's two games going on. There's the chess game and there's the, the front game, which is the sizzle and the glam. Google putting on all the glam out there, Diane Green laying out the pomp and circumstance at, at, at uh, the event. It's sold out and okay, they sold it out. Okay, big, you know, good job. But they're, they're really doing a good job of marching down the road. They're serious about the enterprise. That's a non-story at this point. They are 100% serious about the cloud. Uh, in the enterprise. The question is, what does it take to be a serious cloud contender? There's so much going on. There's a lot of certifications, you got security, you got IOT, didn't hear anything about IOT. So that's all that stuff going on, that, that's evolution. But the battle's going on in the stack. Yeah, well, how do you get your applications <laughs> into that environment? I think, I mean, they're doing something really smart where they're creating a lot of really compelling services, not just on the core infrastructure side, um, but then also some really just unique, very use case focused services. I mean, I don't know if you've dug around in them, but yeah. there's even like genome specific, you know, uh, services that they have, video transcoding, things like that. And, but I think the real trick is, is going to be how do they get, yeah. how do you get data and how do you get uh, th those applications yeah. into that environment? And I think they're moving, like the battle of the clouds you mentioned. Okay, yeah. well, how do you go from an, an AWS environment, which is really specific, very, purpose APIs that is unique to Amazon. You can't just transplant those things into, uh, yeah. in, into, into Google. So I think it's pretty interesting what they've been doing around uh, some of the Kubernetes yeah. technology in order to make applications portable. It's almost like a Trojan horse yeah. that they've been. It's they've kind developed. of fun to watch. I mean, David Vellante and I were talking last night. I've been covering Google since, as a company since the founding of, uh, in 1997, 98 timeframe, watch them grow. We've been watching all their cloud moves. We've been heavily watching Amazon. So we're very deep on Amazon. Uh, Microsoft Azure watched that kind of cobbling together of their, of their, uh, their platform doing very well. But it's interesting to see the approaches. On one hand, you get the cloud definition of the commoditization of infrastructure as a service and all the stuff that goes on in the traditional cloud definition, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service. Yep. And, but what's happening now is, as the competitive battles have kicked up, they're layering SaaS on top of that. So if you throw 365 on Azure, the market share is amazing, they're kicking ass. Oracle's throwing their apps on there, and now you see Google with G Suite. So that's kind of a dynamic that's a red flag for me, because I think there's two games going on. There's the enablement yes. of SaaSification, and each vendor has their own approach. So yeah, I get the, you know, the, the manufacturer, the traction, but the, rea the real action is how do people write their apps, as you mentioned, and, right. and let's break that down. Cloud native, uh, what does cloud native mean to you? What does that definition mean? We had Scott Rainey on Venture Capitalist, and last night at the Cloud Native uh, Compute Foundation, there was multiple definitions. And then you have companies in the enterprise who have legacy apps who want to either uh, you know, wrap them up in a container or do something to make them portable or cloud-like, right. cloud-ready or cloud-enabled, and then you have net new development going on in the cloud with legacy infrastructure. So all that is super complicated. Can yeah. you break that down for yeah, us? Yeah, I mean, okay, so you got a spectrum, right? You have, uh, you have people who are, yes, all cloud-native, we're jumping in at feet first, you know, folks that are, you know, Scott Rainey is investing today, maybe that's entirely where they're living. The reality of most enterprises that are somewhere in the middle, and they're still working their way to adopting cloud. So they're having to really bridge the gap. And I think yeah. the the getting to multi-cloud, well, the first they got to get to hybrid cloud. <laughs> and so they have, a, I think there's several steps in the journey yeah. that they have to take to make to make their applications be able to consume it. And look, they, you know, I, I, people don't need to be consuming the latest in containerization to do this. People have started to figure out ways to, to do that. Mm -hmm. um, 
at least you know in terms of like you know where we've been focusing it's it's been about um, if that application is portable how can they go and consume the data and how can you transfer data between on-premises and a public cloud and then from one public cloud to another public cloud and I think so with with, with Google in particular they have they've created a bunch of compelling mm -hmm. tools and services to, to build applications but how can somebody use a multi-cloud to build an application that's running in Amazon, but then sneak some data out to take advantage of those, some of those Google services? Yeah. And I think that's kind of I think that'll be some that's of the, the first, cool first chess moves that I think they, they can make. And that's why I mentioned Kubernetes earlier because I think that. What do you mean that chess move? Break that down because you're basically teasing out something that we've been looking at since KubeCon, which is now part of CNCF, which is the, that show name. But Kubernetes allows for a company to essentially have a at workload well, on a cloud and then start doing stuff with other clouds that might have different services. Well, okay, you're building an application in an AWS context, and it's specific to the AWS context. Okay, well, that's a non-portable application. This is like yeah. building an application that's to run on Windows. I mean, people don't want to get yeah, you know, locked, be, be in. locked in again. Um, so. I think the investment in, in something like a Kubernetes or in containerization of workflows creates this application that can be more ephemeral. You can run parts of it on premises, you can run parts of it in Amazon, and you can run parts of that in Google. So now you have this application that is a little bit more portable, mm -hmm. that means you can do something multi-cloud where you couldn't before. Yeah, I got to ask you a question on this because I have a friend, I won't say his name because I don't want to uh, expose the, the, um, the person, told me that he'd been running trace routes across multiple clouds with peering relationships, and the latencies are off the charts. I had another friend who told me that Microsoft Azure has multiple sets of services that are running multiple reverse proxies. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of kind of like kludges out there on this inter-clouding inter concept, which is the, where we think it's going, right? We think it should be that, hey, if I have a workload and some capacity or some sort of service I want to use at, the, at another cloud, I should be instantly, seamlessly be able to move that service over in real time, low latency. Right, and, okay. but that's so hard, it's hard, right? Yeah, so right. why is this so hard? Right, it's hard, it's, <laughs> it's hard because of networking, it's hard because of data, it's hard because of the, the way that you have to move different parts of your application around. And, and so, at least the problems that we've been trying to help solve for people, I think we're seeing a lot of desire to use uh, 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 clouds like the Google Cloud, but it's hard because either they have this big bulk of data that's on premises that they need to con that they need to use up in that environment, or you have some you have data that's in in say an Amazon S3, and the, the the portability of data is just so intense, especially when you see very large pools of data, hundreds of terabytes, petabytes of data. So let's get back to this, this is important, this brings the AI question in. Portability of data becomes a big thing. So it sounds like what we're saying is, is that companies are taking a first step approach of, here's an app, it's on Amazon. Here's an app, it's on Google. Mm -hmm. Different apps, here's an app, it may be on Oracle Cloud, if it's Oracle related database. So you're starting to see apps uh, domiciling on clouds relative to their 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 spec or their, their code or their, or their functionality. Okay, that's cool, that seems to be a safe bet, because you're got on the stack, you're there. The interesting thing is, to actually use AI is to share data. Yeah, because you- So, you know. Right. The, because, are they stovepipes, like just stuck in the silos? Right, because then you, to figure out where that data goes, you, I mean, the, the storage system should go, hey, I, I know where you're going to be using the data, yeah. let's figure out where it needs to go based on what policies that, for that type of data. Okay, let's break down uh, cloud native then. So my definition of cloud native is uh, kind of a highest level abstraction is a application or company that is building all their infrastructure on the cloud, no on-prem. So the hardcore definition would be um, like our SiliconANGLE media, we have no data center, it's all in the cloud. Now we have Amazon and, and IBM uh, cloud we use. So, okay, we're cloud native, I guess. Um, is that too broad or is it more specific because the CNCF meeting last night, they were talking about cloud native is you're using microservices and now the new serviceless term is out there. Whereas, so where's the, where's the distinction? What's your definition of cloud native? You know, and I, I, I think that it's, certainly it's great to be using microservices and containerization and, and making these ephemeral workloads. And I think that that only bolsters the adoption of these cloud services. But I think there's, I think there is a middle ground where you're going to see enterprises that they're not fully writing these containerized services in order to start adopting and using cloud and taking advantage of the services that are out there. Um, they can take they can take and run uh, and, and use AI services. They can run 
very specific data services that are in these public clouds without having to necessarily convert every single application over. I think when, when, when you throw something out like cloud native and that is something that you must need to, to go down, that means you can't take advantage of the services that are out there. It's like, yeah. no. I think there's ways that, that people that are in the enterprise can use these services while they have their existing workflows. Yeah. And I think that's- That's hybrid cloud. And I think that's high, and 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 I think sh can can you can you you know crank things over to, and say cloud native and do, but does that is that some sort of purity and virtue? No, people just need to get their jobs done. They need to build you know they need to run their workflows. They need to you know produce content. They need and they, security. They need security. They need you know they're at the end of the they're doing a job. They're processing data. They're computing on it. They're serving applications and not there's not one size fits all for that. Joe, you think about product all the time. As the founder, you, you hand the CEO reins of, of your company to an operator who's going to run the day-to-day, -day, as they say, keep the trains running on time and grow. You're focusing on the product side because that's where the action is, and certainly there's a turbulent market. It's a great opportunity for you guys. are well-poised for that. But as a product person, looking at the Google um, opportunity within the enterprise, specifically, mm -hmm. um, what do they need to do? Where are they on the progress bar, in your opinion, and what do they need to do to be successful going forward? Obviously, uh, you know, I don't want to compare them to Amazon because Amazon's way out in front, but there is a long game here, um, and the enterprise is difficult. What's your thoughts and opinion on, on uh, and reaction to where Google is and what they need to do? Yeah, I mean, I, I am, I, as, a, as a product and kind of representative of Swistack, I mean, we're, we're excited about Google. We're, we, we're a, a partner with, with Google right now, and the, re the reason is, I think, is because of the, the focus on use case, and I think that's the way for them to get penetration into specific industries is by focusing in on those use cases, building out the the sales and go to market go to market in those particular use cases in those industries, and just crush them and then go wide from there. Yeah. That's that's. But they still have some I work to do, do under the covers. What are the, what is that in your opinion? I mean, security. We heard that on stage, but what specifically? I mean, Kubernetes is a nice, I think, nice nice secret weapon there that might <laughs> is going to come out of the woodwork. In my opinion, we'll watch that. But where are they? Where are they got to work on? What's the what's the homework assignment for Google? Gosh, I'm not going to give a homework assignment to Google. <laughs> I mean, I, they, you know, I think I mean you have to have a lot of respect for yeah, both AWS yeah. and, and Google in terms of their product portfolios. Yeah. Um, I think they're it's clear they're doing different things. I think the that Amazon is 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 you know, they're they're more rapid response. They're they're broad and wide. I think Google is being very focused and they're creating yeah. core you know strong technology pipes. I think it's a different strategy, yeah. right? To say that one should adopt the other strategy is yeah, they're, I, they're, I they're, it's think, clear. The differentiation is becoming clear. The horses on the track, if you will, are mm -hmm. starting to you know show their cards, if you will, on what they're doing. Google clearly going after using a tech advantage, right. AI and machine learning. Clearly having a you know you know a modular approach to, right. to not, building code. Right, they're not going down the path of, oh, we're going to take every single Amazon service and create exactly the same yeah. uh, thing. This carnage that people try to do that. There's a, hit, there's a, tr there's a dead bunch of dead bodies on the exactly. side of the road who try to replicate Amazon. Exactly. So they're trying to change the game and use their, their products as an advantage. All right, so what news do you guys have? What's going on? What's your conversations this week at uh, in San Francisco as yeah, a company? Yeah, like I, like I mentioned, uh, we're Google uh, uh, Google Cloud Partner now, uh, SwiftStack is, and one of the, the, the from what that means from a product point of view is we have, um, we can take an on-premises data footprint and synchronize that with the Google Cloud. And what that means is people can put data that they workflows that they have on premises, applications that they have on premises, they can synchronize the data out to that Google Cloud, and then they can use the array of services that are available for them there. And if they're cloud native and they're using microservices yeah. and have built containerized workflows with Kubernetes, yeah. then they can burst from on premises to public cloud pretty seamlessly. Yeah. So give us an, uh, your take for the enterprises out there watching. It is a complex game. We have the inside baseball view of what's going on, but a lot of enterprise buyers and people who who have the mandate to really re-architect right. their, their digital transformation plans are squinting through all this and trying to understand, besides all the, the sizzle around AI, which is pretty clear and obvious, what, what's your advice to them in terms of how to approach and, and use Google and get in, in, involved in some of the things that Google might have to offer and what would be a, 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 a nice path for them to take? I, I mean, I think I mean, we're, we're focused on how we can do multi-cloud data management. That's where we're ending up as a company. And that means taking the on-premises footprint, step one, number one, is taking that on-premise footprint, getting it cloud ready and using cloud-based architectures. And that's the, the work that we've been mm -hmm. doing to make an a public cloud storage environment 
be on-premises so mm -hmm. they can ready their applications. Step two is to be hybrid mm -hmm. and be able to use and synchronize their on-premises workloads with the public cloud. And then step three is multi-cloud, yeah. going between cloud yeah. environments and on-premises depending on the workloads. It's interesting, need. Joe Joe Arnold here, the founder and chief provost of SwiftStack, uh, breaking it down. Interesting commentary, I wrote a blog post out last night, or this morning I posted it, um, of analysis all around it. And I just kind of wanted to put it out there to compare Amazon to Google, and it was pretty obvious there's a big separation, but and, you know, we're going to be reporting here, and then in my subsequent blog posts, kind of the difference in flipping around where Google's different from Amazon. You mentioned that they're not trying to copy Amazon, so they really can't compare apples to apples there. It's apples to oranges. Um, but you do see some fundamental architectural differences. Amazon, a building block approach. Google has a completely different architecture. So one of the things that's come up, and this is where it's important, I want to get your thoughts on to end the segment, is um, Google are saying, well, we don't need that because we're different, so you can't compare what Amazon's doing because the way we architect it, it's just different, so we don't need that. Therefore, it's not a bad thing, it's actually a good thing. But where people are focusing the criticism on Google on is, is that they can't put their data, they can't control where they can put their data. So from a sovereignty standpoint, mm -hmm. if it's in Germany, you see these, you know, the, the availability zones. What's Google's answer to that? Is it the fact that it's, everything's encrypted? Um, is it because it's not an issue because they have a different architecture. Sure. I mean, What's I actually, the... I mean, I think I, they've been very vocal, I think, in, in stark contrast to Amazon in the adoption of hybrid cloud. I mean, I think they kind of, they, they have very vi publicly stated that as a thing that they are supporting and, and are up. And I think that's their answer to supporting things like data sovereignty. They've built out a very vast wide network and they're certainly taking advantage of that with all the services they can go put mm -hmm. on onto that. And um, and I think what that means is they're saying, look, we can't, we're going to have fast access to the services that you need and if you need data sovereignty and we can't provide it, then well, we certainly have a very fast network connection to where it needs to be. And then by embracing the, the hybrid cloud, that enables them to have some answers yeah. for that. Yeah, it's interesting. Certainly all this uh, matrix of this and that and apples and oranges is going to keep the analysts super busy. Uh, so we love covering it here on SiliconANGLE. Joe Arnold inside the cube, breaking down. Google Next, the opportunities. Watch the Kubernetes, watch what's going on with the data. This is a big trend, multi-cloud is real. We've been talking about it with Pat Gelsinger for many, many years. and It's actually happening, it's a multi-cloud world. Look for the containers, look for the Kubernetes, look for the microservices. That's going to be the cool, fun area to see the apps come out of that. Joe, thanks for spending the time, appreciate it. We'll be back with more live coverage here in theCUBE after this short break.